Um, so welcome everyone to San Diego Comic-Con at Home Presents. Yes, they're teaching with these now. Um, publishing and creating comics with the classroom in mind. My name is Adam Miebert. I am an educator in my going into my seventh year of teaching on the south side of Chicago, the south suburbs to be specific. Um, I am a reading and English teacher. Uh, I am a reading specialist. I have presented um, across the country at conferences and conventions on how to incorporate not only comics, but pop culture in general into classrooms. Um, I've also just started a uh, YouTube channel called Can I Teach It that explores the teachability of pop culture across mediums. Um, today, we'll be talking with uh, a panel of publishers, creators, and educators to talk about the dynamics uh, between all of those three, um, you know, with, with education and comics obviously being at the center. So I will let my uh, fantastic panel of peeps uh, introduce themselves. So I will uh, hand off the floor table to all of you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for asking me to be part of this panel about comics and education, two, two great tastes that go great together, like chocolate <laughs> and peanut butter. Um, I'm Gina Gagliano. I am the publishing director of the Kids in YA publisher uh, that specifically does comics and graphic novels, Random House Graphic. Jill, over to you. Hi, I'm Jill Gerber. I am a longtime humanities teacher. Uh, I just finished up my first year in Salt Lake City teaching middle school, the Roland Hall School. Uh, previously, I was in St. Louis. Deans, wrap us up. And I'm currently in St. Louis. My name is Steens. I am a cartoonist and editor and professor. I am the cartoonist on the syndicated comic strip, Heart of the City. Um, I edit all kinds of comic books, including working with publishers like Matt Cave Studios. And then I teach cartooning at Webster University. All right, so um, uh, just a little preamble as we start to get into our discussion. Um, comics in the classroom is a movement that is here. Uh, and it is no, no longer a discussion of if, it is a discussion of how. Um, no, you know, gone are the days where Corey Matthews' teacher from Boy Meets World uh, was kind of embarrassed to talk about teaching things like X-Men in his classroom. Uh, you know, it is a established movement in education that things like comics and graphic novels are used as educational resources. Um, relationships have now been built and established with uh, not only creators, but also the publishing industry in general. Um, and, you know, those relationships have been fostered uh, through things like teaching guides, through panels, through different events in which all of those publishers, creators, and educators can collaborate, discuss how they, uh, how these texts can be used in classrooms. So I'm going to start kind of uh, bigger in general here for, for my panelists and just kind of what has been uh, your experience with the creating, publishing, and teaching of, of comics and graphic novels up to this point. Thanks, Adam. So as I said, I'm the publishing director of a Kids in YA graphic novel publisher, Random House Graphics. So my experience has been uh, very centered on the publishing side of things rather than the, the education side of things. So super excited, Jill and Steens, to hear from you too about, about your experiences there. Um, so, you know, my experience with this is, you know, Random House Graphic now is uh, a year and a half old. We published books before that I, uh, before that I worked with First Second and my experience there was on the marketing and publicity side. Um, so not only do I have this publishing background, I have a background doing specifically a lot of work with teachers and with school librarians. Uh, to make sure that comics get into their hands and through them to their students' hands. Uh, and it's, it's definitely been an interesting journey. Um, I started in the comics publishing industry back in 2005. And at that point, definitely there was this excitement for comics and graphic novels from many teachers that I met. But similarly, many teachers I met had questions about how exactly to use them in the classroom. Many teachers I met had 
uh, feedback from kids or parents saying, are these real books? You know, should we be using them in the class, replacing prose or alongside prose, you know, and how, how would we do that? Um, and I think that through, through the work that everyone in the industry has done, that attitude has changed a lot, but it's definitely still around today where people uh, who are parents, people who are kids, people who are educators are finding comics for the first time and still grappling with the idea of you know, this, this new medium and how to, how to use it as an educational tool. Jill, over to you. Um, well, I've, been, I've had comics in my classroom for a long time for independent reading. And um, I started, this was a long time ago, my, the, the, the years are blurring together. The first book, uh, and Gina, you have a lot of, of uh, experience with this one, uh, that I taught in school um, as part of my regular English course was American Born Chinese, um, which is still in my mind um, a, a canon. And actually the eighth grade teacher at my current school teaches it as part of an identity unit. Um, I do a little bit of everything now. I use it in conjunction with prose novels, um, teach them separately as uh, discrete units. And then also um, what I've been really trying to do a lot of over the last few years is have kids produce their own comics, whether it's zines or um, comics like I mentioned earlier about uh, creating adaptations of, of prose novel we're studying. Um, there, it's pretty, un, you know, limitless in terms of the use, particularly with a big shift in critical li literacy and visual literacy. Um, comics are really amazing to do that. Um, and there's also now a big push with own voices and bringing in a wider range of materials in a humanities course. And luckily, there's been a surge in nonfiction comics for younger ages. So um, I, I, I've kind of toyed with a lot of it and, and um, I, I absolutely adore comics because they allow everybody to have a seat at the table. Um, and the nature of the collaborative medium also is something that I think is really important for kids to understand that um, the industry in order for a book to be really successful, it takes a lot of people to help and a lot of feedback. And, and it's a long process. And I think with kids wanting immediate results of things and wanting to kind of be successful on their own, um, I think there are a lot of life lessons in there as well. Um, so I've, I've used them for a long time uh, to kind of sum up and be short. <laughs> I think what you said about, you know, the collaborative effort and um, the not just the literacy, but also the visual literacy is, is really important because I think one of the reasons why so many people are, are hesitant to see comics as something that you can use as an educational tool is the misunderstanding of how comics are even put together and what they are. You know, it's more than just words plus art. You know, they work together. I used this analogy earlier this week, but it's basically like there's a difference between weaving in synthetic hair into your hair to give yourselves box braids between having a hat that has braids attached to it. You know, <laughs> like it's not the same. <laughs> it may look the same, but it's not the same. You know, you have to know that they have to work together. You know, I do a, uh, uh, an exercise in my cartooning course where they take a strip comic like Nancy or something, and one person will write the script for it and then they give it to another person and that person has to draw that comic based on the script. And then when you see the difference between the original and what the, uh, the student actually draws, you can see that there needs to be more uh, collaboration. You need to understand how's the best way for me to communicate what I'm thinking to you. And then for the artist to say, well, how do I take what you're telling me and communicate it to the reader? You know, so there's a lot of collaboration and, and that's a really valuable thing to learn, especially if you want to get into a creative, um, a creative industry, you know, you have to learn to work together, you know, and reading comics and understanding how comics are made is a really good way to understand that. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, oh, 
Go Sorry, ahead. I cut somebody off. No, I think just seeing that that process, right? That to that understand uh, the the cognitive process that you need to go through, not only in just right reading this thing, but also creating this thing. I think is in, incredibly important. You know, if we're talking in a in, in the sense of the classroom, right? That um, for students to see kind of the full dimension of a thing, I think it is incredibly important. So not to just say, hey, this thing gets dropped off at the bookstore at some point, like there is a very uh, detailed process of, of what happens before and here's what it looks like. And here's, I think that also makes that accessible to them. So I know, Jill, you talked about kind of creating comics and so, to, you know, you, you did as well, Steen, but I think seeing what that process looks like makes it accessible to them. Um, instead of something where it's just like, uh, you know, students are hard on themselves uh, and they go, well, I can't make that thing. Um, but I have, you know, I've seen in my time incredibly talented artists and writers uh, come through my classroom. And, um, you know, I think seeing that accessibility and how they can create, um, you know, the things they love, I, I think is fantastic. Yeah, and I and we're seeing more and more and in scenes I'm thinking of something you tweeted out maybe a week or two ago. We're seeing also a lot more um, creators sharing their process mm -hmm. um, with thumbnails, with um, how to color, things like that. So that's been really useful for me as a teacher. Um, and, and it's really important if you're going to start teaching comics is to, to kind of follow along, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram. Um, so to bring those resources into the classroom and help kids understand the whole thought process and then how does that connect with the reader? Um, we do it a lot with prose and it's really neat to see it done with comics because the, the, the decision-making is so layered. And when the kids start looking at those things and how they react to it, it then extends into you know, pop culture or media in general, and they become much more critical about what they're consuming. Um, so I highly recommend educators who are interested in, in learning more to really connect and reach out via social media. Um, there is a ton of resources right there um, at your fingertips. Um, and that's the other neat thing about comics and education. I have like there are so many amazing, generous creators out there. They really want to connect um, and, and love when kids are enjoying their books, um, which is a little bit different than regular publishing, I, at least in my experience. Yeah, and you know, that's- that I, I was gonna say, uh, when you were talking about, you know, media literacy and all that kind of stuff, it kind of also reminded me like there are some publishers I'm going to shout out Random House Graphic <laughs> that you can tell in their books that they're not trying to teach kids how to read comics because they already know how to read comics you know if a, if a kid is on the internet they know how uh, memes work and visual memes and TikTok I mean that sort of understanding language and communication through different visual means is something that's kind of already baked into a lot of these kids lives and I find that some publishers are just better at recognizing that. And I think Random House is one of those publishers that is, you know? Thanks, Dean. Um, and we also, I mean, to, to add on to what you, you two said about like collaboration and the process, we also do this thing where, um, I'm gonna hold up this book and see if it is visible. Um, but this is a piece on the copyright page of a book that's called The Colophon. Um, where we in every book have the authors talk about how they make their book, um, you know, and like what tools they use. Because I think that the comics process can be a little bit of a black box to people, um, especially kids. Like everyone at this point kind of understands like the typewriter, the computer, like, you know, you put words into something and then out comes a book at the other end. Um, but when you get a graphic novel, um, especially as a kid, there can be a lot of like, how in the world did someone make that? Um, so we, at the beginning of our books, have some, some text from the author about 
the different the different tools that they use. And then often at the end, um, our authors are inspired to, to do things like this, a graphic novel from start to finish, where they talk about things like thumbnails um, and pencils. And uh, this is this is um, just roll with it by Lee Durfe Lavoy and Veronica Agarwal. So you have you have tiny Veronica and Lee here kind of guiding you through their their creative process. So, you know, hopefully the idea is at the end, uh, you too can have a successful comic and also some adorable cats, uh, <laughs> but also to, to really understand that this is a, a process that not just these amazing, talented creators can do, but that everyone can do these steps and come out with uh, their own comic as well. And I love that you're doing that in uh, graphic novels or, you know, uh, collected editions, things that are actually bound because in a lot of single issue comics, um, they do the same thing. You know, their back matter is here are the ideas that we had for the cover or like um, sometimes in collected editions, you'll see uh, pictures of the script and what they decided to work with and what they decided to, to not work with. And that was actually one of my favorite parts of comics when I first started getting uh, into the direct market of comics of single issues and whatnot. I was like, wow, they're like really talking about how it's done. And so to have that in a book that you know is going to get to a younger reader because you're more likely to get a book from a library than you are to get it from a comic book store these days, especially if you're younger, um, having that sort of thing in the back of the book is great. I love that. Yeah, me too. So like this is um, Romina Yee's seance tea party and in the back we do in fact have that very thing of the different the cover different designs design. and approaches from getting from there to, to here. Uh, because I, I love that sort of thing too and I think that as well as making comics being a bit of a black, black box publishing can be a bit of a, a black box as well. So you know, anyone who is inspired to make this sort of thing, the, you know, how do I get it from, you know, a piece of paper that I've drawn on to, you know, being a book that has like a spine and an ISBN and all of that is, you know, there's, there's not the sort of common knowledge about that. So including that, I think, makes the publishing industry a little more accessible for anyone who's reading. What inspired you to do that? Because not many publishers are doing that for middle grade and YA. Um, well, part of it is that our, our creators really love doing this sort of thing. Um, and part of it is that I, so I grew up um, reading mostly genre fiction. So science fiction, fantasy, and there is a long tradition in that those sort of books where writers at the end really just like put themselves out there on the page and talk about their editors and the other writers they know and all of this sort of thing. Um, and I loved reading that growing up. So um, it's something that I, you know, we, we kind of give all of our authors a kind of like, you know, here's the, the one sheet list of different things that you can do with the extra pages in your book that our senior editor, Whitney Leppard and I put together. Um, so part of it's influenced by that. And part of it's also influenced by the crossover in our readers between, uh, not our readers, sorry, the crossover in our creators between people who read the single issue comics that Steens is talking about and the people who have read science fiction and fantasy, and then the, they themselves being inspired to get into the industry because they had the access and exposure to that, that sort of material about what the industry was like and how other writers were interacting with it. It also like humanizes the creators, you know, because there's, it's very easy to just see someone, an author's name on and be like, wow, they're amazing. I'll never get to know who they are, you know? And making sure that they have an opportunity to really talk about themselves in the process is a great way to remind readers that they're people as well. And I think I got that when I was growing up from manga um, in uh, Clamp, uh, written manga in, in particular, I knew that the entire team was of women and certain people did certain pieces of inking, others people did backgrounds. And I only knew that because it was in the manga, you know, 
and the internet <laughs> wasn't like as robust as it was when I was younger, which is a weird thing to say, but you know, it, having that actually there is really, really helpful. And it helps more than you think. Like, I don't think I've ever really considered how helpful that was until right now and really talking about it. Yeah, it's especially having it in the book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You plant that seed, then kids can go to the internet or other resources. I, I really, as a teacher, I love having it in the book as opposed to, you know, something I download as a teacher and say, here, kids, read this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's it's genius, you know. It, oh, I love well, it. I mean, we, we I like... I can't take all the credit. We are also helped by the fact that like one of the exciting secrets of publishing is that um, the way that that books work, and I don't think I'm going to be able to, to like zoom in close enough to show you this on this book's fine. Uh, but you like the I'm looking at the binding of this book right here. Uh, but the, the way that books work is that they're printed on these giant sheets of paper, right? So the, the pieces of paper are not this like, five and a half by eight size. They're, um, they're like 16 times that big. So I'm stretching out my arms and you can't see them because the zoom window isn't big enough. Um, but what happens is you print that huge size of a piece of paper and then it gets folded up and folded up and folded up and the edges get cut off. And then you have like a little pamphlet that goes into the book and then you print the next page and it's another set of 16 pages. Um, and so what happens then is that, you know, people aren't like writing their story to be like, you know, is this 200 odd page graphic novel a multiple of 16? Like, do we have the exact end of the book on, on a multiple of 16? And also that's not good because you have these other things like a title page and a copyright page and an author bio and sometimes a back ad and you know, depending on the book, you might need to have something else in the back. Like if it's a book about food, you might need to have a recipe. Um, so oftentimes when we get a book in, we then like block this all out and do math and then are like, we have another three pages that something needs to happen on. And, uh, you know, so then we are, are helped by this, you know, standardization of how the pages need to work to look at what kind of interesting and creative and generative material that can be added to them. Mm -hmm. Adam, I feel like we're extremely off topic. No, <laughs> no, you know what, I, I'm letting, I'm letting you all go because this, this is fantastic. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think a little bit of or a lot of what has been discussed is, you know, I know, Jill, you brought up uh, the accessibility of creators. Um, you know, I know it's been discussed of, you know, the back matter, Jeannie, you're talking about a lot of the back matter scenes, you're talking about the effects of the back matter on you. Um, so, you know, my, my big question is where, where, what are some other like successes or things that you're drawn to that you could say, well, here's something that students will really gravitate towards. Here's something that, um, so I guess, where are you seeing, in your opinion, the successes of, here's what the publishing industry is doing, here's what maybe creators are doing and, and how it could affect classrooms. What do you think are the, the biggest things? I know, um, I know Steen's uh, a, a big thing that I propped up on uh, my, I did a D and D episode of my uh, YouTube show and I brought up Rolled and Told as a, as a great entry point, a book that, that you're, largely responsible for in addition to some great creators but that was a book that I said this is this is you know instead of jumping into like fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons like y'all need to be looking at rolled and told um, just because not only is it an amazing resource I think you know in my experience with Dungeons and Dragons something that's a lot more accessible than than a lot of what Wizards of the Coast is putting out um, but, but where are you seeing you know I, let's kind of keep this rolling what are some of the other successes what are the other things um, that you are all really digging in terms of, of that relationship between teachers, creators, and publishers? Uh, one thing that I've seen a lot is that um, kids, or rather students, are looking at more than just the few place, places for their reading. You know, it's not just the library and the bookstore. They're also looking at zines. They're also looking at digital comics. They're also looking at web comics, like webtoons and tapas. So they're already under the impression that you can get comics anywhere. 
But I find that what's helpful is not just saying you can get comics anywhere, but also bringing them in. So I travel a lot for conventions and I also spend a lot of money on comics at conventions. And sometimes they're not comics that I even wanna keep. I just wanna read and then share with other people, you know? And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll go to a convention on a weekend, I'll come back and I'll bring the whatever comics I don't wanna keep and I'll give them to the students and they can kind of pick and choose what they like. And oftentimes it's all kinds of comics. And typically though, the ones that stick are the zines. And I think that's because they're so easily made that it looks like something that they can do. You know, it looks like something that they can just grab a sheet of paper and they can also make a mini comic based on whatever they want. And they don't have to be stressed out by the idea of, oh, well, I don't know if people want to read it. Doesn't matter. You made it. That's what counts. Or I don't know if I'm ever going to get the story published. Like it's published now that you have drawn it self-published, you know? So I, I think what's really helping is for educators as well to do as much research on comics as their students already are, you know? Yeah, um, Susan, I think that's great. And I think, you know, when we talk about, I think like sharing and the pass along readership of graphic novels is an important thing to be thinking about when we think about the successes of comics. You know, I think that you, when I think about comics, there's always, there's maybe three different levels that I think about them on. One of them is, you know, there's been awards that comics have won. There's been kind of media victories. There's been the sort of like high level, like Gene Yang becomes the national ambassador for young people's literature. Like Linda Berry wins in the MacArthur Genius Grant sort of thing. And like, those are amazing. Like they, open up the opportunities and the avenues for the industry. Um, and then there's individual projects like um, things like the Will Eisner Libraries Grant that really give individual communities and places also the, the same opportunity. Uh, but then there's also the success on the level of uh, you know, individual instances. So every time a teacher uses a comic in the classroom, uh, Every time a kid reads a comic for a school book report or a school project, um, so many people have a central chunk of their exposure to reading as kids through schools. Mm -hmm. And if we want comics to grow, it's vital that comics are part of that experience, that they're in classroom libraries, as you were saying before, Jill, uh, that teachers are encouraging kids to read them for school reading, independent reading, for book reports, using them as sources or parts of, of class projects, um, and you know, having them in the, the school library, not only the classroom library, having them as part of the curriculum. Um, and I think this is especially vital because kids, like, I think reading is great. I think all kinds of reading are fun. Um, comics have a reputation as a fun kind of reading. Um, they, they're something that kids really enjoy and engage with. And I really want that sort of reading is fun association that can come along with comics to be part of how kids think about reading right from the beginning of their reading experience. And that's, that I think is the, the ultimate success of getting people to jump on the bandwagon with reading and keeping them reading all throughout their life. Yeah, I have two thoughts. Um, one, one of the things that um, makes me most excited about comics is the fact that um, we are seeing, and it's just, Kind of like the beginning. I, I don't think we're there yet, but um, so many more um, original and inclusive stories. And because it's a visual medium, I think they do a really good job of creating empathy and understanding in our readers. Um, and I, I, I'm excited to see even more, particularly with the success um, many of those books are having, um, and there is a big need, right, for it. Schools and teachers are finally beginning to kind of make that a priority through groups like Disrupt Text and things like that. So we're starting to kind of see 
um, uh, and, and adding on to the canon. Um, so that area is something that I think is incredibly valuable. I also think comic, uh, comics are also a great resource for adding reading across disciplines. There are a lot of amazing resources out there that are in graphic format um, that could be used in any discipline. Um, graphic medicine has a ton of really cool things out that would be really useful in a, in a science classroom. And then the, the last piece, um, and Nick Susanis is really kind of a, a, on the forefront of this, is also looking at comics as a way of showing thinking. And some of his work and some of his colleagues' work has me really excited about getting educators to think about how do we ask kids to communicate what they're learning or how they think. And I think that that we're just at the, you know, at right at the edge of knowing where that kind of work can lead us to, you know, much, much stronger critical thinking um, and, and understanding. So there's a lot to be really excited about with comics right now. Yeah, and so, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the next question I wanna get into is, is a little focused on, on the publishing side, but I think we can kind of make it work for education as well. But from the, from the publishing, publishing side, um, you know, with the understanding that, you know, a book like the, the sequel, the Cardboard Kingdom sequel, uh, you know, with, with you know, uh, scenes, I know you're doing your history of tabletop role-playing games, um, you know, that's something that I'm going to bring into my classroom probably to give context when I might do a little D&D campaign with my students. Um, so with the understanding that, you know, Cardboard Kingdom, I know, kind of builds out stuff for, uh, you know, not only projects, uh, but also, you know, some, some little lessons and things. Um, what are the considerations being, being made about these books um, in, in the publishing and creating phase, knowing that um, educators will use them or could use them? Adam, I think that's a great question. And it's, it's an interesting one to think about from the publishing side of things. Um, at Random House Graphic, we, we're a trade publisher. And what that really means is that we publish books where we first think about reading and reading for entertainment rather than the education market. So we're not making a textbook. Um, you know, so the, like the sort of thing that I, you know, read in my English class when I was in fourth or fifth grade, which was like, you know, this book that had like, you know, after each short story piece, it had a set of questions for discussion and the teacher got a teacher's guide. Like we, we don't do that sort of publishing at all. And there is a specific other education market that, that does specifically provide those sorts of explicitly educational texts for school. But that all said, as a kid's publisher, we think a lot about kids and we think a lot about age category and accessibility when we're making books. Because even if we're not making something that, you know, comes pre-prepared with a, uh, you know, a lesson plan in the book, we are making something that's specifically for children and teenagers to be reading. Um, so the content that we're publishing is, you know, thoughtful and interesting and challenging and sometimes silly and fun and sometimes serious in a way that specifically works for the age categories of readers who are the, the target audience for it. Um, and the, I feel like this is kind of a silly thing to say because it seems like common sense, but it's also a pretty new thing in comics publishing. Uh, where comics publishing has historically thought of their, their readership as this general all ages block of people, which means that books are generally accessible to everyone. And that is, uh, that's really interesting. And it historically made comics really accessible to a whole lot of readers, but it has also, I think in my personal opinion, lost a little bit in not focusing on that kid in middle school, that kid in high school, that kid just starting kindergarten, 
and their different experiences and reading levels. Because definitely your, your experience as a, a kid who's four and five in kindergarten is different from your middle school experience when you're 10 or 12, and also very different from your experience as a 17 or eight year old, 18 year old. Um, so because of that approach, um, I think that the kinds of books that we're now publishing are easier for educators to see having a clear place in their, their classrooms, in their different ages of classrooms. Um, and one of the things that I think that's cool that's going on in education right now is that there's a movement to replace textbooks the kind that I learned with, with a selection of nonfiction and fiction books instead, um, and getting people to not just engage with an excerpt, but to be reading books start to finish and you know, be reading contemporary books rather than the, the classics that were in my school library. That's really the sort of thing that our books would, would work with. Um, you know, and then the other thing to kind of add into that uh, set of things that our books can do is that when we publish our books, we uh, have a whole creative team. Um, our senior editor, Whitney Leppard, our senior designer, Patrick Crotty. We have managing editorial and copy editing people who look at our spelling, our grammar, all of that. We have, uh, you know, production people who make sure that our, our paper, our covers are the, the highest quality possible. And that that dedication to producing a, a book that kind of stays on your bookshelf, that stands the test of time, I think also is very compatible with what educators are looking for and what school librarians are looking for. I think as an editor, the demographic kind of colors everything you do about that book. You know, if your demographic is for middle grade, well, it probably shouldn't be about drug busts, <laughs> you know? So I think a part of it is understanding who your reader is, but also when I work with writers, I like to have them remember, not just is the story good and entertaining, but is their story effective? Because you want a reader to get something out of your book. You don't just want them to read it and be like, that was entertaining. I mean, that's nice sometimes, but if you have a point or an idea that you really want to get across, then we have to think about what's the most effective way that we can do that. And when you think about it that way, then you have an easier time understanding, well, what are the ways that I can market this to schools and to educators is what are those major themes in there that will help people figure out what, who needs to read the book and for what reason for how long, et cetera. Um, I also think it's important for us to remember that we won't really know what people get from a book. You can try and make it effectively, you know, X, Y, and Z, but everyone is different. And so everyone's going to read your book differently as well. So just making sure that you have that in mind that you don't know what you're creating is actually going to do for somebody is a really good way to just kind of I don't know, it's just something nice to have in your heart when you're writing. <laughs> I just, I kind of think of it as like, when you're in school and like a teacher is like, don't mind my, you know, crappy drawing. I can only do stick figures. Like there's a student back there that's doing stick figures and they think it's good and they want to continue to draw their stick figures and get better. But the second they hear, oh, I can only do this. This is bad. You know, that's what they get out of it. So I think always keeping in mind that someone else is listening and someone else is going to uh, have their, may have their life changed by what you're doing. It's just mm -hmm. always something good to have in, in mind when writing. Yeah, and so then, um, you know, taking it from the, from the publishing side to the education side and, and um, you know, I know we have, um, you know, just Steens, you teach um, at, I, I forgot which uh, college you said or university uh, you said. Yes. Okay, so I know you, you, you teach um, in that capacity and, and Gina, um, you're a teacher as well. So I guess the, the consideration would be, our, our next question is what are the effects of, I think, seeing a bigger push, uh, you know, so there are teacher guides or there are in the, in the age of social media, which we are well in, you know, there's the accessibility of creators. So I think, you know, what are some of the, you know, there are, um, 
uh, you know, I think publishers who are, st who are, who are linking up, who are putting on uh, or putting their creators on, on panels like these. So I think, what are you seeing as the effects of um, the publishing industry making a push, knowing that these things are being taught um, in classrooms and, and being mindful of that. So where, where are you seeing the effects of, of that educator centric push, even though it's not a widespread thing uh, or, or a massive thing, but where are you seeing the effects of, of a push like that in certain initiatives? Well, I see it from college students, mostly because those are who I teach, but I find that they are more willing to try different things and are a bit more accepting if they have had history of using graphic novels and comics in their classes. Um, it, it really gets them thinking outside of the box, really. You know, if you go and you have the same kind of education, you know, K through 12, and then you come to college and we're asking you to read you know graphic novels to understand something they start to feel like oh there are other ways that i can learn things which is why i really love nonfiction graphic novels a lot because i was definitely one of those kids that hated reading nonfiction for school like the second i get a packet that's just words i'm like well i guess i'm failing this class because i'm not reading that um, but to sh to give other people different options to get that same information is super, super helpful. And um, when they know that they have different ways to achieve something, it makes them more likely to try something. Joe, what about you? I know you- Yeah, what do you think? What do you think, Joe? Um, I don't think, just to be honest, I don't think the publishing industry is doing enough mm -hmm. um, to reach schools. Um, I, I, think that a lot of it is coming from more from educators who are trying to kind of push the momentum forward, whether it's through things like Nerd Camp or the Lit X initiatives. Um, I'd love to see publishing doing a little bit more, um, you know, because a lot of educators don't have access to things like NCTE or ALA or big conventions to get out and find out more. Um, so I think we're just kind of at the beginning, but I, I, I find that more of the momentum is really being carried on the shoulders of teachers, less publishers. Um, but I also have really strong opinions about teacher guides and I don't find them to be very useful um, in terms of really, truly integrating comics and helping teachers integrate comics into the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I find a lot of them are written by marketers as opposed to true educators, uh, which might be part of the problem, but I would like to see more happening um, at the grassroots level to help folks who can't, who just don't financially have access to a lot of the traditional publishing uh, roads to find out about comics and about um, and what books are out there. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Like, I'm working with a bunch of different publishers, and on the editorial level, there is no, you know, consideration of where these books are going to go other than their uh, comic book stores, you know, and they, we know that more people are going to be reading this book than just people in comic book stores who go, but when it comes to like the editorial level, there's like nothing. I think the most that we do is make sure that there are page numbers <laughs> so that it's easy to go to the right page. Um, so yeah, it would be good to start integrating that sort of thing and not just with editorial, but also with, uh, the creators as well. Like if if you're asking those questions, if your book is going to be taught, what's something that you want readers to get from it? And having that information would be very helpful, I think. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think we're just at about the two, three minute mark wait, wait, left wait, here. Wait, Gina was talking. <laughs> oh, sorry, Gina, go ahead. But we're, we're wrapping oh. up soon. We are wrapping up soon. Okay, okay. well, I was, I was just going to say that definitely across the industry, there's, there's always more to do. And definitely some of that, that effort comes from publishers and, you know, not just being at conferences like NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English Conference, or at, you know, comics academic spaces like the International Comics Art Forum, 
and you know doing teachers guides hopefully in partnership with teachers who are working in the industry today um, but there also is this question of you know how do we make those changes so that it's like not only teachers can buy the classroom set of graphic novels so that every kid can be reading them, but so that they can afford new contemporary books every year. You know, what is, what is the thing that can be done with our education system so that the teachers in the classroom are supported by principals and superintendents so that they can get the professional development work to make sure they feel comfortable with teaching this comics material and keeping up on these books and have the budget to be reading contemporaneously with what's being published that year. And then to be able to, from their own knowledge, then pick the best of the best and afford that for their classroom. And, you know, that's something that there are, there are some teachers who are in a financially privileged position in a financially privileged district where they can do that, but that is also not the state of things across the U.S. in school districts today. And I think that the, the thing with comics is that they're a new thing. And so they aren't necessarily part of a lot of teachers' training in coming up when they, they went to school, when they Kind of figured out how they wanted to teach their classroom they have to get this new skill and there's not necessarily the support for that in the education system today for stuff like comics much less all the rest of the stuff that people need to know about we are talking about D, &D you know video games are also a thing that frequently comes up as a narrative that people can use in the classroom that teachers may not have the experience with or the access to. And then just also things like, you know, students you were talking about webtoons and tapas, like computers in the classroom and teachers having the ability to access those and, you know, the education to kind of understand how to teach kids all about media literacy. And I mean, there's, there's just so much stuff that a more robust teacher support system in the country could help out with. And, you know, comics are one of the things that are in that category of new things that we need more resources for teachers to be able to truly bring to the, the classroom in the robust way that they should. Yeah, no, um, I, I, great. I think a great point to make. Um, I know that was kind of where I was going to end. Um, so <clears throat> I think Gina, kind of what you said was going to be an answer to what I was going to ask. I think really quick in closing, um, you know, as I guess as briefly as you can, um, what are your hopes? Uh, you know, I know, Judy, you just kind of detailed a bunch of those. But what are your hopes for the relationship between the publishing industry and, and the education uh, profession, let's say, or the, you know, schools, uh, teachers in general? What are, what are your hopes for the future of the, the dynamic between those two things? Yeah, I mean, Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go for it, Steens. Um, I was going to say, kind of, you know, jumping on what Gina was saying about accessibility um, and, and resources to purchase that sort of thing for your classrooms. Um, I'd like to see more of that, but I would also like to see more of that in libraries as well. Um, just because, you know, a lot of kids, they don't get their books from schools, but they get their books from libraries. But I mean, I was even thinking about when I was making their graphic novel memoir section more robust at my library, I always had to fight for it. You know, I always had to prove that this is worthwhile. Same for like the zine collection that we started. Like, it's a lot of work to try and get the powers that be to understand why something is worthwhile. So I'm hoping that maybe as time moves on, the people that are currently working now to make those uh, resources more available are going to be those new powers that be, you know? I think for me, um, continuing to do things like what Random House Graphics is doing with their back matter is hugely um, helpful. I also um, hope that publishing industry continues to look at diversifying those who are working in publishing to make sure that we're getting a full range of voices in particularly like in the editing room. 
um, so that we have people that have uh, unique experiences that might reach a broader range of people, but also to educate them on, um, like what Gina was talking about earlier, what does a middle grade reader look like and what connects with them, um, as well as, you know, we've got to figure out a way as a, as a country to make books more accessible in general. Um, that's the only way we're going to develop and continue um, to feed a love of reading. Yeah, no, and I, I definitely agree with both of you. I think more kids reading means more people reading and that's the, that's the ultimate goal. Um, yeah, and then Jill, to go back to something that you said, I think a few questions earlier, I think that um, when you think about comics in the classroom, there's a lot of focus on the English language arts classroom and thinking about comics outside that space, I think helps with this as well not just the English classroom, but history, but science, uh, making it part of the art curriculum as well, um, you know, because it really is um, like interdisciplinary and intersectional in those ways, which is, which is awesome. And I think that expanding the, the area of comics just means more partnerships, more working together, more, more opportunities for all of us. Great stuff. Again, well said. Um, for, wanted to, you know, that's our wrap. So I wanted to thank all of you for um, a great discussion of publishing, creating, and teaching with comics. Um, I am a member of LitX, which is a cohort that sponsors the um, literacy around pop culture, literacy across different mediums. Uh, this is part of our San Diego Comic-Con programming. Um, you can find LitX on Twitter at WeAreLitX. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Adam Abort. And where can uh, my panelists, where can um, everyone find you on the internet? Um, you can you? find Random House Graphic on Twitter and Instagram at RH Kids Graphic. And that is our website URL as well. Um, and my name is Gina Gagliano. So you can find me on Twitter at underscore Gina Gagliano. And you can find me on Twitter at Gerber Jill. And you can find me also on Twitter at Steens, And my website is ohaysteens.com. I do um, class visits all the time. So if you're interested in me coming to your class and talking about comics, you can find my information that way. All right, everyone. So this has been, yes, they are teaching with those now, publishing, creating, and teaching, or publishing and creating with <clears throat> the classroom in mind. Um, appreciate your time. Feel free to reach out, of, uh, reach out to all of us as necessary with any questions um, and enjoy the rest of your San Diego Comic-Con at home experience.